We're going to in welcome Dr. Visser. <coughs> Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I have flown in from New Zealand specifically to come to talk to you. Um, I have not been paid to be here. I've come voluntarily because I am so concerned about the situation. I've been very interested in hearing some of the comments that have been presented here. I believe that as a scientist, it's important that we separate the business rhetoric from the facts, and that's what I'd like to do today. Um, I do have some slides, please. What is your last name? I'm sorry. Visser, V I S S, -S E R. Thank you, sir. Great. Okay, so I thought I would just give you a little bit of a brief introduction to myself because coming from New Zealand, you may not know who I am. Um, I've been studying orca since 1992 in the wild, from the polar waters of Antarctica to the tropical waters of New, uh, Papua New Guinea, but also in New Zealand. I've been involved in eight different rescues of orca in the wild that have all been returned to the wild, and I've published 20 peer-reviewed papers that specifically deal with orca. But I have also visited ORCA in 11 different facilities that are held captive. That includes the three SeaWorld facilities. And just yesterday, I was in the San Diego facility, where interestingly, I was actually told I had to leave. Now, obviously, SeaWorld is concerned about me being here because I am speaking as a scientist. And they're concerned about what I've observed at their facilities. So I'll leave it at that, but just so that you know, I was told to leave. Now, I have also got experience working briefly with Keiko, who the industry will tell you uh, was a non-success. You would probably know him as Free Willy. It was a success. Now, we also um, work quite extensively with my project with Orca in the Wild, and that's what I'd like to do today, is speak to you about the comparisons between <coughs> Orca in captivity and in the wild, to put that into perspective for you. From research, we know that Orca travel, on average, 138 miles a day. Now, that's not just a one-day event. This is two different studies that have shown these animals are doing this over extended periods. Sometimes. For 44 days, the average distance has been 138 miles. So I wanted to put that into perspective for you. If we take a circle around SeaWorld's proposed new tanks, and we do 122 kilometers or 130, sorry, 222 kilometers or 138 miles, that takes us well south of the border. If we do just two days travel, that takes us up well north of here. That's two days. This new tank does not meet even these basic requirements. No tank ever will. No facility of any sort ever will. It's a true fact. It's a scientifically proven thing. Okay, now there are definitely some populations of orca who don't travel those big distances. We know this, but it's their choice. They are not contained within tanks. They are not sent into medical tanks. They are not separated. They have a choice. And these animals in captivity around the world, including SeaWorld's animals, do not have this choice. Now, we know that orca have been around for a long time. They've been around for approximately five million years depends on where you divide that line. Now let's put that into the scale of humans, less than half a million years, but again, where do you divide that line? We even go back to 3.6 million years, but orca still have evolved longer than we have. By having these animals, first generation, second generation, third generation, even in captivity, you still do not take away the fact that they have evolved in the wild. They have not evolved to live in tiny little concrete boxes. This is an example that you're going to probably see a few times today. 
Up in the very top, inside the circle, is a little blue box. That little blue box represents one of the tanks at SeaWorld, albeit one at San Diego, uh, sorry, Orlando, not at San Diego, but the concept still applies. The new proposed tank will be approximately the depth of the circle around this box. The yellow line represents an average dive for a single dive of a wild orca, a single dive. They can do anything up to 500 of these in a day in the wild. So a tank that represents that little blue circle up in the top does not meet the needs of these animals. To put it again into perspective for you and something that you can relate to, I did not know the dimensions of the Statue of Liberty. I apologize, I had to look them up. But when I saw them, I was horrified. Four times the size of the Statue of Liberty for a regular dive for an orca. So let's put that again into perspective of what you would see at this new proposed tank. The new proposed tank would be approximately, at its maximum, 50 to 55 feet deep. Okay? Now the tablet that your wonderful Statue of Liberty holds is 23 feet long. So two times the length of the tablet, not four times the length of the statue. That's what they're proposing. This is just a bigger box. You will hear SeaWorld say many things about what they do. Some of them are actually pretty good, but some of them are atrocious. Making these animals do tricks is not what they should be doing. They will tell you that coming out and seeing these sort of behaviors, this is normal behavior. It's not normal behavior. This is a trick, okay? They liken it to the situation that you see with orca in Argentina. This is a research project that I'm involved in. The orca there come up onto the beach, but they do it for survival. They do it to hunt their food. This is not a trick. This is a risk for the animals at times, but this is very real. And SeaWorld tries to tell you coming out onto a slide is normal behavior. It's not. There are fewer than 20 orca in the world who have specialized in this particular behavior. Now, you've also heard about the teeth. This is a photograph that I took of an orca in SeaWorld. These teeth are broken off not because of food handling, as you were just told, by the esteemed vet. I am not criticizing his qualifications. I'm criticizing the concept of what he's trying to portray to you. This animal here has tooth damage as an individual, not at a population level, which we do see, but as an individual because it is kept in captivity, because it has chewed on the side of the tanks because it has chewed on the bars in the tanks. This is not because it has been handling its food. Food handling happens because um, in the wild they have to capture their food. In SeaWorld it's shoved down their throat in handfuls. The animals do not handle their food. In the wild, orca are known to hunt sharks. I know this. I'm one of the scientists who has published about it. SeaWorld will tell you that it's, they get, orca in the wild get tooth damage because of handling sharks. And yes, it's believed that some of them do, but it's not been proven. In New Zealand, these orca, which I see on a regular basis, also specialize in hunting for rays. When they handle the rays and the sharks, this is when we would expect to see teeth damage, if it is as proposed by SeaWorld in their fairy tale concept. But here we have a photograph of an orca handling a ray. This orca, I know, also hunts sharks. You can see very clearly there that its teeth are in pristine, perfect condition. I know of not a single orca in the whole New Zealand population that has a cracked or broken tooth. We recently had some orca turn up in New Zealand that all died. They stranded and died. It was a very tragic event. But three of those animals had worn down teeth to the gums. But they were worn down as an age-related food handling situation, not because they were chewing on concrete tanks or bars. So the size of the tank is not going to alleviate the stress issue that has created this problem. 
Now, also, in, when I was at SeaWorld, I photographed in San Diego the images both on the left and on the right. This is young Nakai. Nakai was injured. SeaWorld told everybody that it was from contact with the side of the tank. Now, I quote that contact with the side of the tank. If that's what their tanks are doing to their animals, this is not a good concept for you guys to be endorsing getting a bigger one. However, I truly believe as a scientist that this was not from contact from a tank. This was from aggression. Close up, you can see four puncture marks that match the spacing on orca teeth. And on my professional career, I swear that I truly believe that this was from aggression. Now, Nakai's wound on the right, you can see it's nearly healed, but this is four years on and it's still not completely healed. Aggression, I have observed at SeaWorld every time I have gone to any of the parks. This is the same orca, Nakai, hammering into the side of the young calf. So hard, his rostrum is buried into the side of that calf. I was absolutely horrified and disgusted, not only by what I saw, but by the staff member standing there laughing and telling the public that this was play. In the wild, you never see this. This is what you see. Two weeks ago, I spent 22 hours with a mother grieving over her dead calf. She carried that calf lovingly for three days. That is what happens in the wild. You get true family bonds, not construed by humans. You get families who care for each other. You do not get aggression where young males are nailing young calves against the side of tanks. It just doesn't happen. Now, these two photographs show two animals. The one in the top is the mother of that young calf. These are self-mutilation wounds. These orca have inflicted them themselves because of the stress in their tanks. You can see scars where this has happened previously. This is not a one-off event. Now, the animal on the bottom left, her name is Morgan. She was taken from the wild, albeit under a rescue. Yes, she definitely needed help. We have never denied that. The problem is that SeaWorld now owns her, and SeaWorld holds her in an overseas facility, and SeaWorld's pledge conveniently excludes her. So her offspring will be used because she's not included in your little caveat that you guys have put in place. Let's not even go down the whole thing of the dorsal fins, but suffice it to say that in the wild, less than 1% of adult males have a dorsal fin that is collapsed. But in all aquariums, all around the world, 100% of adult males have collapsed dorsal fins. Now, you don't have to be a scientist to work out that there's some correlation going on there. How much money is SeaWorld going to spend on this? There are all sorts of proposals. But you've also been asked and told to look at the options of sea pens. I know that's not in your mandate, I know that's not in your jurisdiction, but I beg you as individuals to consider it from the bottom of your heart as something that can be recommended to SeaWorld to look at. Cetacean sanctuaries do not have to be scary big things like the vets make them out to be. These places can be monitored, they can be controlled, and believe it or not, the ocean is actually a great place. They'll tell you it's a scary, bad place, but hundreds of thousands of orca managed to survive out there. But because these animals are coming from captivity, they are in a compromised situation, we realize that they may need some level of care beyond just putting them in a sea pen. So it is feasible to have medical pens in there. It is feasible even to go to the extent where SeaWorld could have an off-site facility where the public could go. The public could still see orca. Let's put these animals into a retirement system. Let's put them possibly into a rehabilitation centre and even possibly look at release into the wild. The public doesn't have to be deprived of seeing these animals that are now there, but we can phase them out 
and I really uh, hope that you guys will take the right step in the right direction. Thank you very much.